I mean, I tell you what, from the obviously straightforward, with the moment that we set forth this, we were on the way home and God gave me this message when I was leaving this place. So I'll tell you how real that is. We literally sit down here and we ate and we fellowshiped and we talked and we set a date in my phone. And as we were leaving, God began to put this message on my heart. And it didn't change. I didn't want it to change. I preached this maybe two years ago. And it's funny because if you ask my wife, they didn't get to come tonight. Kids are already tuckered out. She's with them. Um, but if you ask her, she'll tell you this service we were at in Pennsylvania, she said this is her favorite service that she's ever been in. So what's that tell you, right? I'm not saying that because of me, but I'm saying that God just laid that on my heart just like that for you all, right? So I just pray and hope that your minds are ready just to think about what God is doing. And I just want to start by saying that, right? Like, you know, if you pay any attention to your church, you see what God is doing. Right? If you pay attention to kids, to young people, to young adults, to your main service, if you're not blinded and if you're not just here to be here, you see what God is doing. Right? And I, I'm here to tell you that you need to get in and, and get with it. You know, over there, I was thinking as I was praying, I think about that, the lame man in the Old Testament, right? That, you know, he was, sit, he was sitting by that pool for years and God would trouble the waters and he was just waiting for somebody to do the work for him. Please pick me up and take me to the water, right? Because he thought that's the only way he could be healed. But Jesus showed up and finally said, hey, do you really want to walk? Well, yeah, well, we'll get up. And he got up and he was healed, yeah. right? Like, I'm here to tell you, get up. Because yeah, I'll I, I tell you, I'm going to be honest. Y'all know me by now. I'm an honest guy. Right, And when I was a teenager, I used to sit there in my pew at church, right? And you know, as a preacher's kid, I told you I was a PK. That's a hip tame for it, I think. That, you know, I, I never wanted to go up front to make a scene because I always assumed the worst. That people would think that the pastor's son is being bad, he's sinned, he's in trouble. Like, what do he do now, right? Because they had this expectation over my head that was unrealistic, right? And I always used to test God, and, I'm, and I feel horrible about it. But I'd always say, Lord, if the worship team would sing this one song, I'll go up front. And you know they sang that song all the time. <laughs> because he knew that I needed to come up and worship him. And it's an old song called Let It Rain. Some of y'all probably know, but that was a popular worship song in my time growing up as a teenager. And I used to say, you sing, they sing that song today, I'm going up front. And they did, and I did, right? But it shouldn't have took me doing a little test like that, right? I should have been open and willing and saying, Lord, all that you do, all that you've helped me with, all that you've done for me, I need to praise you. Yeah. Right, so I'm going to start out a little twisted on what I'm going to preach on here. So I'm going to give you my kind of thought first, right? So I want to talk to you about a king. His name was King Jehoshaphat. We're going to be in 2 Chronicles. I know a lot of people think Old Testament. Like, oh, no. Right? You young hip-hop people. Right? We don't like the New Testament. But y'all know the same God that did miracles then is the same God now, right? Okay. At least we're all on the same page. Right? And I think about this king. And I have, you know me and my short little titles and my notes. Simple title for this one. Worship wins the battle. I thought, you know, when I left that day, I thought, you know, nights like this, you can speak on a lot of stuff. You can speak on how to worship, what it looks like to worship, um, what worship really means. But I thought to myself, as I was driving out here, I thought, there's been so many Wednesday nights that I leave that I know that people aren't surrendering all. Because yeah. I can feel it. Right? I can feel that God is doing awesome things and, and people are getting saved and baptized and people are getting prayed for. But I still believe that there's people sitting there. That God's undoing the chains, you know, but we're not really stepping out of them. And I think about this, this king, right? And I've told my, and I learned this, right? And I, and I want to help you because I didn't learn this at your age. It took a lot of hard experiences for me to learn this. That's why I want to bring it to you. So I always used to think that something bad would have to happen before I would really worship the Lord or really cry out to him. Like if, you know, somebody was dying or if I was seriously hurt or if I didn't have any money and I, I was needing my car fixed or I need a job in high school, whatever it looked like. I thought it had to be some serious thing, right, for me to truly come up and worship him and think, Lord, 
I, I'm at my lowest point. I don't know what else to do. Now I'm going to come to you. Anybody else think like that? Right? That's human nature that for some reason we put God last. Right? But one day when my mom was super sick and all them years in the hospital, going back and forth for months, and I remember that I was away at work and they called me and we had to end the life talk and I had to make all those decisions on the phone, which was horrible, and I had to go through all that. But I remember I came back from uh, training at a job and I went to the hospital and she was coming back from a test, right? Now, mind you, this is like two years in, okay? And this is what changed me, is she was coming down the hallway, and I hear her singing in the middle of Ruby Memorial, just singing and worshiping God, coming down the hallway. And I'm in my room, and I thought, we literally just had a talk a week ago, and the doctors asked me, do you want to continue this? And I thought, if this lady, they literally just asked her if she wanted to give up and stop medicine and give it all up. And she's worshiping God in the worst time. But she's worshiping because she knows that she's going to be all right. I thought, man, what's wrong with me? I mean, I come to church on Sundays healthy and, and not hungry and, and comfortable, right? And I come to church knowing that I have a place to worship, that I don't have to be afraid or no one's outside with a gun saying, hey, you go in, you might be a, a martyr today. I don't have to fear any of that. But still, I come into church sometimes. I'm not going to lie. I just come in and go through the motions and say, God, I'm glad we came today. It's been good to be here. Thank you for all that you do. And that's where I messed up. That's what I learned later in life is if I get to the mindset that I worship God when everything is going good and not when it's just going wrong, watch how much your life will change. Watch how much things will change for you when you start to worship God and thank Him before things even happen. Could you imagine what worship service would be like if people, we all had the mindset? Man, and I'm guilty, right? I, I, I told you, I'm guilty. I'm not perfect at all. I struggled this morning at church. You know, I was tired. My daughter had me up at 5.30. I was tired and thought, man, of all days, why does it got to be today? Right? But that's life. Right? That's life. That's things we go through. But you got a choice to make. I can pout and be mad and frustrated and tired and, and complain and just go through everything that you want to go through where you can just say, God, you're in control and I know how great you are and you bless me more than I could ever imagine. And today I'm going to worship you because I have breath in my lungs. You better read. Oh, I do. You know, I like to joke a little bit, too. So last time I was here, I had the little bottle. And if they don't like you, they give you a little bottle. But if they like you, they give you a bigger bottle. <laughs> right? Because if it's little, they want you to leave quicker. If it's bigger, that means you can stay a little bit. So I appreciate it. <laughs> we passed. Yes. Dude, no, I'll be, I'll be running to the back. Ah, time out. Here you go. <laughs> All right, let's start. We're going to go to Second Chronicles chapter 20. I'm going to read, we're going to read about 29 verses. Amen. But I believe, amen, God's just trying to do something for us. Let's start at verse 1. <coughs> 1 through 9. After this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Munites, sorry, I'm going to mess up some of these words, but it's okay, declared war over Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They're already at Hazan Tamar. This was another name for En Gedi. Jehoshaphat was alarmed by the news and sought the Lord for guidance. He also gave orders that everyone throughout Judah should observe a fast. So people from all, all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat stood before the people of Judah and Jerusalem in front of the new courtyard at the temple of the Lord. He prayed, O Lord, God of our ancestors, you alone are God who is in heaven. You are the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty, and no one can stand against you. O our God, did you not drive out those who lived in this land when your people arrived? Did you not give this land forever to the descendants of your friend Abraham? Your people settled here and built this temple for you. They said, whenever we are, are faced with any calamity such as war, disease, or famine, 
We can come to stand in your presence before this temple where your name is honored. We can cry out to you to save us, and you will hear us, and you will rescue us. So, you know, I'm not big on notes, but I got little slashes here to remind me I need to talk. I need to talk right here for a second because they knew, amen, that God told them, if you cry out to me, you come to me. If you're in need, I'll save you. And they knew they would be rescued, right? And he went to his people. He went to his people for a fast, right? And, and some of us, let's just be honest, we don't really know what that is. There's a lot of people that I met that they've never fasted before or they've never been a part of a church that does that or never been a family that did that. And that's simply giving away something, right, to just take that time and to love on God and no distractions and fast something that you love, right? And what it does, it just draws you closer to God, right? And that's what he did. He went to his people and said, hey, the army's coming, the war's coming. We need to fast and pray and seek God for what we're going to do, Right? Now, you know, I'm, I'm all excited, right, for this uh, youth retreat coming up. And, you know, God's doing awesome things, and I hope y'all are getting excited for what God's going to do. And, um, thank, you know, my wife and I have been blessed, right? You know, God's just doing awesome things for us. Um, in June, they've asked us to come to camp in Pennsylvania, and this is a dream come true of mine. It's, it's never happened to me. I've, I preached there years back, um, but I wasn't married then. So they asked me to do the nights, and then my wife, she's going to teach in the mornings. So we're super excited about that. But I'm going to tell you something, that with these things that come along, I'm going to fast, right? I'm going to fast and pray because I'm seeking God to do something great in your all's lives. Why is that? Why do we care so much? Because I care because I know that God is trying to do awesome things, and sometimes we just need a little step. We need a little help to get over the hump. Right? That's what I love about tonight, is that there's nobody here that's holding you back. Right? We're not worried about lunchtime. We're not worried about uh, what's happening after, after church, where we're going for the day, our parents, or, or whatever, or, or just folks in the church, you know, some crabby people. Let's just be honest. Right? Let's just be real. Right? None of that's happening tonight. It's just a moment that we get to come in and soak and worship God. And I pray that's what you do and just here in a little bit. That's why I told you not to get too comfortable, right? Because I've been a part of lots of services like this. That worship service was awesome. And then everybody just goes back to their seat and kind of gets content. And that's it. But God just wants to do more. God wants to do something, amen, inside of your heart and your life, amen, to get you to the next step. Amen. Let's go to verse 10. And now see what the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir are doing. You would not let out the ancestors invade those nations when Israel left Jesus. Or Jesus. Huh. Listen to me. You tell I'm getting old. These letters are getting littler. <laughs> left Egypt. So they went around them and did not destroy them. Now see how they reward us. For they have come to throw us out of your land, which you gave us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, amen, but we are looking for you to help, right? Anybody here ever face something in your life that you just don't know what to do, right? It's, it's beyond your control. It's bigger than you think. It's harder than you imagine, and there's nothing else that you know how to do. God, you have to help us, right? God, you have to help me. God, you have to make a way, and you got to take care of these things, right? You know, we could go around the room. We could talk about problems that you have, right? Some are great, right? Adults are going to have, this is more financial problems, and some of the older ones may have some health problems, and we might have things going on, and we talk to some of y'all, right? What do you got going on? Problems at school, problems with your friends, your teachers, right? Everybody has problems, right? And you get to a place that, you, you get to a place that's like, Lord, like, why does this problem still exist? Why has this not been taken care of? How do I get through this? What do I do? Anybody else feel like that? Or am I just like on an island by myself? Yeah, y'all feel like that, right? You know, I remember now, you know, as a teen, I just, I, I'm straight with you. As a teenager, I was bullied all the time. I had all kinds of stuff going against me. I was way taller than everybody else. I was bigger than everybody else. I was a preacher's kid. I didn't have much money. So you can imagine, them things all stacked up against me, right? And I got made fun of all the time. 
And I used to hide it. I didn't tell my parents. I didn't tell anybody. But where I got in trouble was how I faced it was I shut down. I didn't do my schoolwork. I didn't do nothing. I got behind. Then I'd get in trouble. Because why'd you have an F? It wasn't because I wasn't smart, but you pulled out my desk. I never did anything because I was just so emotionally tore up that I didn't know what else to do. And I was afraid, right? I was afraid to talk to my parents. How are you afraid to talk to a preacher? He's your dad. I was. I was afraid. I don't know if I was embarrassed. I don't know. But, you know, just like this, right? Now, I didn't have a physical army trying to kill me and to take my life. But I had people, amen, that were trying to push me so far out of way that nobody, I felt like nobody wanted anything to do with me. But then I'd have all these people when I'd go play basketball that would love me. Because I was fun. I was good. I was way above level at that age. But then I'd go back to another world. And those people didn't want me. And they would make fun of me. And, and teachers would let them. And you know what happens after a while, right? I mean, you snap. And I regret some things I did, right? Because you just, you don't want to be that person. But sometimes things get so hard just like this, but you don't know where to turn to, right? And that's what I admit to you. And you can look at me and say, well, you grew up in church, and everything around you was church, and it was. Amen. But just because everything around me was church doesn't mean, amen, that I just automatically get it. Like, you have to experience it. I can sit up here and talk to him blue in the face and cry and laugh and run and shout. But until you get it, you're not going to get it. I mean, I, I remember this service one time that, yeah, you know, I, some service you just feel like, I mean, it's going to just boom, right? Like it's just about to go and it's just exciting and, you know, God's moving and people are up front and people are, are just crying out and, I thought I had this message, right? I thought, man, this was it. And I thought it was going to be like, whoo. I remember I got up there and I preached. And literally, people just sit there. And I was done. Like, they just sit there. And I started to question myself and think, like, man, where did I go wrong? You know? Because I don't, I don't sit there with an expectation that this, this, and this is going to happen. I come in believing God's going to do something. Right? And I remember I just sit there and thinking, what, like, what happened? And I begin to think to myself, did I mess up? Did I do something wrong? But I thought, until they get it, until they understand how real God is, they're not going to get it. And they finally did get it. They finally did get it. And thankfully, the church that I was there with, the youth pastor at, right, he was Super involved in the youth. We started having youth service two nights a month, right? Every other Sunday night, people would come. It was awesome, right? But we had to start. We had to figure it out. We had to just say, hey, let's make it happen, just like we are tonight. Like, we can talk about these things all the time, and we can sit here and wonder, and, well, I wish there was 100 people. I don't care if there's five people, right? Because there's young people that are hungry for the Lord. I truly believe that, right? Because there's people that come on Wednesday nights and we're done and say, hey, can you pray for this? Can we talk about this, right? Can we do this and can we do this? And to me, that shows me, amen, that God is stirring people's hearts. And when God does that, get in, right? Get on the bus. Get on the bus. Because the bus is going to pass you up. I don't know about y'all, but I want to be on the bus, See, good thing I got these lines here, so I remember where I was. Verse 13. All the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, wives, and children. The Spirit of the Lord came upon of the men standing there. His name was... Hmm. There you go. Son of Zechariah, son of Benaniah, son of Jael, son of... Yeah, thank you. A Levite who was a descendant of, yep, see this is like a game show, yep, yep, what's that one show, you know the stories towards that guy that was like, yep, <laughs> I appreciate these folks, right, because it's sometimes my Barber County education comes up, if y'all don't know where that is, you'd, under, you'd understand, he said, listen, King Jehoshaphat, listen, all your people of Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. 
Don't be discouraged by the mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Right? So don't be afraid or discouraged, right, of what enemy's trying to attack you with. Because I'm going to tell you, he will, right? And the enemy wants you to be destroyed. He wants you to quit. He wants you to give up. Amen. But God says, stop fighting the battle that's mine. Right? Like, trust me, this is my fight. You know, the God of the universe that created everything, do you not think that he can take care of us? Right? And I sit there this afternoon and hmm, thought, Lord, like, why is this, this, why is life so good, but yet it's so bad? Like, you know, I, I'm thankful for all the opportunities here, and we prayed for things to happen, right? And God's doing awesome things. But in the personal, a lot of bad things are happening. Like, why are they running together? Why is this happening? Right? So I have a choice. I can be happy with what's going on here, hate what's going on here, be in the middle. Amen. But I know no matter what, God has this battle. It's his fight. Right? So stop fighting. Right? Because I'm a man. And, and the fellas in here, you know, like, it's hard to quit. And there's women like that too. It's hard to quit and give up, right? Until you grasp every straw, you try to make it your own, and you try to figure everything out, and then it fails. Because we did it backwards. And then we're up here begging God to help us. I'm miserable. I'll just, sorry, if you at my work, take this with a grain of salt. I'm miserable at work. Bad things happen, it's miserable. God, why is this happening? Why are we going through so much? Trying to have a little one. Why is it so hard? Why is these things happening that I've never faced? Why is this happening to me right now? Anything happened to you right now? Anything going on in your life? Anything going on in y'all's life? Anything happened to y'all? Anything you're just fighting right now and you just don't understand? Why is this happening? But they said, the battle is not yours. I mean, if you don't remember anything tonight, I pray you remember that. The battle is not yours. Give it to God. Hey, Amen. I sit there this afternoon, and you know, if I sometimes I cry. I ain't going to lie. It's whatever. You know, my fam, mom's side of the family, they're criers. It is what it is. I get it honestly, and I don't even care. Right? You get my age, it's like, who cares? If you cry, you cry. Watching TV. I mean, <laughs> you start having kids, it gets even worse. But I was sitting here this afternoon just thinking about all this stuff. Right? Thinking so overwhelming. And I put so much pressure. Right? Because as of, as again, as you're a father and a provider and a, all that, you just, your mind just starts to think like the pressure. Like, how's this, and why is this? And Lord, how come you've answered all my, I'll just be honest with you. I, I say just this week, Lord, how are you answering all these prayers, but why are these things not getting fixed? Right in the, and I'm just going, <laughs> oh man, I'm going to be straight up honest with y'all right now. You're about to see my most vulnerable state. I've been super good. And I'm super thankful that I've been able to hear the voice of God and that God has just been able to shut me up when he needs to and I'll be able to hear him. And the obvious for, for pastor, and I'm sure he might be getting like, what are you doing? Like, how come you're not jumping on ship, right? But I'll be honest with you, I don't do things just to do them. Like, I need to know, right? And I want to know that God says to do this or this. It's the first time in a long time that God hadn't told me a thing. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not doesn't mean anything. Is it, is it frustrating? Absolutely. Because I like to know. I'm a microwave kind of guy. Hit 30 seconds, get it done, and come on. Right? Like, I want to know. this. Why. And maybe that's the problem. Maybe he's trying to teach me something. Right? But these things, they build up. You know, y'all ever just want something real bad and you just can't do it? Or you can't have it? You can't get it? Like, how miserable is that? Right? And like God just, and it's not that I'm doing anything wrong or that I'm just going AWOL. It's literally that the enemy is just trying to defeat us. The enemy is trying to defeat you. And I totally believe that's why God gave me this message. Because I feel like on Wednesday nights, right, over there, it's an awesome atmosphere, but it's not this. And what I mean by that is, at the end or afterwards, 
I still know, man, I can see it. Like, I can read people that you're still sitting back just holding on thinking, man, I should have sang or I should have, like, got prayed for or, or I am going through things, but I don't want to show any emotion. I don't want to, like, let it be known out of all these people that I'm hurting or something's bad in my life. Right? That's what I love about tonight is that right here in this place, those things you're dealing with, stop fighting them and let God take over. Yeah. I mean, let's finish because I really think that God's trying to do something and I need to get out of the way. Sixteen. Tomorrow, march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeril. Close enough. But you will not. E- but you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. Right? So you imagine, right? The leader of all these people, he sought God and asked God, like, God, how do we get through this battle and what are we going to do? And he spoke to him and said, hey, you don't even have to fight. Grasp it for a minute. You don't have to fight and do a thing. But I thought we were about to get killed and attacked. And my people, how am I supposed to sit back and not fight? Trust me. Right? So just imagine what's going through his head. Right? My little problem isn't much because I don't have to lead a whole whole village of people. And this fellow was seeking God. And he got there to watch him. He said, don't fight. Man, can you imagine, imagine people coming against our family. What do we want to do first? I want to fight. Yeah. Right? Like you, you would, I mean, I, thankfully, right, but I feel about like you see these horrible stories and it's like, man, you come to my neighborhood, we're going to fight. You come to our kids, we're going to fight. Right, that's just that instinct. Fight back. But the Lord said, don't fight. So imagine what's going on in his mind. That he didn't even have to fight. Right? But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions and stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out there tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. Then King Jehoshaphat bowed down, down, bowed, uh, bowed down with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. All right, one more time. So think about it. You know, you're, imagine you're in this army, okay, and you see all these people coming, right? And the leader says, hey, we're just going to worship for a little bit. Right, They had their children, their families, and said, we're just going to worship a little bit. And everybody just hit their knees and began to worship God. Can you imagine how fast the atmosphere changed? From fear, afraid of losing your life and being in the hardest battle that you've ever faced. And all of a sudden, none of that matters because you are in the presence of God. Everybody was in the presence of God. It's hard to get 20 people to stop talking and to stop distracting. And they had their whole village bowed down and worshiping God. Man. You know how powerful that is? Can you just imagine the night if we all got up here and just started to worship God like nothing else even mattered? Verse 19, then the Levites from the clans of Koth yeah, and Korah stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. Early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and, he will be, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. After consulting the leaders of the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him, amen, for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to the Lord, but his faithful love endures forever. I mean, could you imagine how foolish the armies thought they were? Right? Like, we have all these, these artillery and all these men, and we're, we're coming in to kill you and, and destroy you and take your life and take your land, and you're coming out singing and worshiping God. 
Could you imagine what was going through their mind? They probably thought already, like, this is going to be easy. Like, this is no contest. They're going to surrender. Like, we're going to go in there. We're going to take them over, and we're just going to be on our way. Right? They automatically thought that they won. They automatically thought, like, they stand no chance. Amen. But what they didn't know, amen, that God was walking right before them. And they didn't see him because they didn't know him. Verse 22, at the moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had finished off the army of Seir, they turned on each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, there were dead bodies laying on the ground far as they could see, and not a single one of the enemy had escaped. I mean, they didn't have to fight. God told them, you don't have to fight. And man, he turned them against themselves, and they didn't have to lay a finger on nobody. Like, that's kind of unrealistic to think about, isn't it? That's hard to kind of grasp our mind about. Amen, but it's so real and so powerful, right? Because they fasted, they sought God. God told them to worship me, to sing a song, to bring out singers and worship, and I'll take care of it. And they obeyed him, and they did that. It said not even one escaped. Right? To be a fly on the wall. To see what that looked like. How these men and armies just turned against each other. You know, armies, they're trained, right? They're trained, they're, they're made to obey at every command and do everything. But it was just such chaos. Amen, because God had it all under control. Verse 25, King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They fa their found was vast amounts of equipment, clothing, and other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder, and it took over three days just to collect it all. Hey Amen, right? That's, that's how the God we serve is, right? He just ain't half doing stuff. He ain't just half taking care of it. I mean, he's really taking care of it, right? He said, you will not die. You won't be defeated. And then I'm about to bless you all like you've never, ever seen before, right? And I think about this. Imagine this man, right, being a man in the war. You, you went, right, you're, you're in the army. And I, I, I don't know, but I can imagine that most of their wives and kids were home, right? So can you imagine, okay, they, they left, and they never knew if they were going to see them again, right? I'm sure now they had faith. They believed. But in, deep down inside, they didn't know. Could you imagine being home three days later, your husband come walking back in, and he's got all this stuff, and thinking, what the world? Like, where did you get all this gold and food and equipment? And you, know, he, he, just imagine that, right? And he would just simply say, hey, God took care of it all, yeah. right? That's the God we serve. He just didn't finish it. He provided more than they ever thought. I'm here to tell you. Stop fighting the battle. Let God take care of it and let him bless your life. I mean, y'all can come back up. Verse 26, on the fourth day they gathered in the valley of blessing, <laughs> which God this name the day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It's still called the Valley of Blessing today. Then they turned to Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat leading them, full of joy that the Lord had given them victory over their enemies. They marched into Jerusalem to the music of harps, lairs, and trumpets, and proceeded to the temple of the Lord. When the surrounding kingdoms heard the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, the fear of God came over them. So Jeho Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for God has given him rest on every side. I mean, I want you to know, amen, when you're done fighting and, you're, and you give up and you surrender to God, amen, think about it. God provided. God took care of the enemy. And then he gave them rest. Because it's weary and tiring, amen, when you face a spiritual battle and you just can't get over it. Right? When I used to deal with them little punk kids in school, I mean, I'd, I'd just be honest. I'd go home and I'd forget about it, Right? 
I mean, thankfully, I had parents that loved me. And I'd go home to a home that was loving. And I didn't, re- didn't think about that anymore. But I'd go back and I'd be in that junk, right? Then I'd have to think about it. And then I would leave and I wouldn't think about it. Then I'd go to church and it was just a cycle that was never ending. That I never knew how to get out of. I heard it. I've talked about it. I saw it. But I never experienced it. Until I experienced, amen, the true promise and the true love of God. That's when my life changed. And God told me to stop fighting, stop trying to figure it out, stop trying to make it better, and just worship me. That's when my life changed. I mean, I'm here to tell you tonight, I don't know what you're going through, right? I I, I always tell you, I'll pray with you, I pray for you, amen, but I don't always pry in your life, right? But I know. I've been around long enough to know now that I see faces and I see hurt and I see things and, and things are different now than they were for me, right? There's so much more junk to deal with than when I was your age, right? So much more just stupid stuff that you got to deal with, right? And I see on Wednesdays even, it's like we just can't let go. I just really want you tonight just to simply let it go. But how? Right? Just like this, Right? The king came out and told them, hey, I need people to sing. I need instrument players. And we're just going to simply worship the Lord. And God told us the battle is his and don't be afraid. And they worshiped, they listened, and God took care of them. I ain't no king. I ain't nothing. But I'm here to tell you tonight, the battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. You worship him, you truly worship him, right? Right? I'm not talking about, I'm just going to be honest with you, I ain't talking about just going through the motions or looking at the words and singing, right? I'm talking about really sit here and what we're singing, right? Really open your hearts and say, God, I know how much you love me. I want to feel how much you love me. I want to see how much you love me. I don't want to just sing about it or watch people be about it. I want to feel it, right? You know, we can, uh, people worship in all sorts of ways, and I ain't here to get on that train, but I'm here to tell you the true worship is right here. When you come up and you worship God with your heart, man, nobody looking to see what you're doing, how you're doing it. God's just simply shining down saying, thank you. You finally understand. They can sing They can sing and sing and sing. And God does things and God will do things. But I don't want anybody to leave tonight missing the chance to let God touch your life. I ain't gonna lie, two, two months ago on Wednesday night, it was, wasn't my place, but I felt like it. I mean, I, I felt like we should have just kept singing, had an altar call. And I thought that God was trying to do stuff, but I just, I didn't speak up because, you know, you know, just get like that sometimes. But I got over it and I thought, man, I think we missed it. Because we didn't truly just surrender that moment and say, man, God's trying to do something. I love everything that about church but I want our experience to be what God does for us not what he gives us not what we look like not giving us of that nature but I'm talking about giving us amen our heart our life he died for us and all I can do is simply just worship him so I encourage you as they sing in your seat out your seat I don't care I mean I just want you to take some time amen stop fighting the fight and let God win the battle for you. Because he wants to. And he's going to. Surrender.